So I want to talk a little bit about the intelligence cycle, but less in an abstract sense and more in sort of an example sense. And so for that, I want to turn to uh, Glenn Hastett's uh, book, American Foreign Policy, Past, Present, and Future. This is the textbook I use when I teach US foreign policy. And Hastett has sort of spent his career sort of studying the intelligence community and this process of intelligence analysis and features very prominently in, in a couple versions of, of his book. Uh, a case study talking about what went wrong in terms of the U.S. government's ability to put the puzzle pieces together uh, for September 11th, 2001 to prevent a terrorist attack. And he sort of organizes that around the intelligence cycle, which makes for a really nice way to sort of introduce the intelligence cycle or to, if you're familiar with the intelligence cycle, to kind of, you know, anchor it in your mind, but also to see some of the different ways in which um, the intelligence community in practice uh, can sometimes work at cross purposes where you can see breakdowns, uh, things that you wouldn't necessarily recognize if you were talking just in terms of the abstract intelligence cycle, which looks really neat and clean and tidy. I think this is a useful illustration of um, some of the problems that can, can crop up in this process that is nominally intended as sort of overall quality improvement. Um, I should also flag that the, uh, Hastic comes off as fairly critical of both the intelligence community and of the Bush administration um, following the September 11th attacks in, in this uh, case study. And so I'm just going to kind of highlight some of the, the points that he brings up as, of things that he has identified as problems at each of these stages of the intelligence cycle. And so if we just kind of start this process, we could talk about the planning and direction piece. And Hastet notes that counterterrorism, or specifically Al Qaeda, uh, gets sort of downgraded in terms of where it falls within the National um, Security Council reporting chain. So there's no longer sort of a, a terrorism person, you know, directly in, in the meetings. They're sort of reporting to other people, uh, which means that there, that's less likely to be a priority uh, for different agencies if, if that's not sort of prominently placed within the National Security Council. Um, also, uh, Hassett notes that the Bush administration sort of reshuffled where Al Qaeda was sort of sitting in terms of the portfolio to understand it as part of the larger Afghanistan, Pakistan sort of environment. And while I think from a policy perspective and sort of maybe from a, a political perspective, that actually makes a lot of sense given where things were in 2001, in terms of intelligence direction, there's a lot going in, in a lot going on in Afghanistan that's not terrorism related. And there's a lot going on in Pakistan that's not terrorism related. And Al Qaeda is going to be lost in the muddle of um, those two much larger, or I should even not even larger, those two very different kinds of um, security problems that the United States was wrestling with in, in the late uh, 90s and early 2000s. Um, in addition, um, with the planning and, and direction, Hastet notes that there was a directive that was sent out to the intelligence community noting that Al-Qaeda was going to be a problem and to be vigilant against Al-Qaeda. Um, apparently that was that directive was sent out to the CIA. However, within the CIA, it was interpreted as intended for the rest of the intelligence community um, because the CIA felt that it was already sort of had Al-Qaeda as a, as a priority that it was paying attention to and sort of assuming that this was going to alert other agencies that may have also thought it was the CIA's sort of responsibility to be aware of and tackle. And so that that direction piece seems to have been muddled or lost in the overall bureaucratic um, chaos uh, that was the intelligence community um, with various different agencies and not a central director of national intelligence to, in theory, help facilitate more effective planning and direction. Uh, when we think about the collection piece, uh, there was limited human intelligence uh, available uh, to the intelligence community. And part of that was a function of uh, directives that had come from the Clinton administration, which limited the ability of the intelligence community to work with people who were committing human rights violations, uh, who were engaging in torture. It was a set of directives that saw signals intelligence and technologically oriented collection as maybe pre preferable to human intelligence. And as a result, the human intelligence capabilities of the United States weren't as developed as they might have otherwise been. And that may have contributed to things. 
Um, but it, there was also sort of a cultural piece in terms of how that collection process worked that has to flags that many agencies that are sort of getting information about terrorism aren't in a counter-terrorism mindset where they're trying to break apart networks. They're in a law enforcement mindset of, I am trying to build a case against a very specific you know, person or a very specific situation, uh, thinking about it in this very narrow um, way rather than thinking about terrorism in, in a broader way that might facilitate sort of seeing different pieces and how they might fit together that requires you to step back and see sort of the big picture. So Hastitz sort of thinks that there's there's a cultural piece that shaped that collection process or the collection processes that maybe was, was playing a role as well. And then finally, um, Hastitz notes that the uh, NSA uh, saw itself as a supporter of others, um, not as a disseminator. So it would be collecting information um, coming in and it sort of saw itself as a library that if you need something, you come to us and you ask and say, hey, do you have anything on this Al Qaeda group that's in Afghanistan? Is there any intelligence that's been picked up from signals or satellites or any, any other you know, electronic measurement tools that we have? Um, and, but the NSA sort of had information that could have potentially been, been valuable to folks, but wasn't pushing it out. It wasn't treating what it had as sort of an RSS feed of routing that information out to the rest of the intelligence community. Um, and so it was this passive collector that wasn't being used to its full effectiveness, according to Hastin. Um, in terms of the processing piece, there was a whole host of things that really complicated the ability of, of processing. Um, one of those is just the, the tendency of agencies to stovepipe their information, um, that you collect your information and you don't sort of disseminate it broadly to the intelligence community. Instead, you route it up the chain of command through through your own organization um, so that it reaches the top. And then in theory, maybe it will get passed to a different agency and then it will route its, its way back down. That stovepiping model of information flow is really inefficient um, and a lot can get lost along the way. Um, but there were other things that, that inhibited processing uh, and sharing information effectively. Um, for example, Hassett notes that the CIA and the FBI were using different classification levels. Um, and the, the rationale for that is that, you know, the CIA has sources and if those sources um, are giving the United States information, sure, that information might be helpful to, you know, prosecute a case against a terrorist somewhere else. Uh, and the FBI might want that information and might want to use it in a court case. But if you use that information in a court case, is it then possible to figure out who was the source that provided that information? And therefore you've just burned a source in the process of prosecuting a case for the FBI. The CI has very little incentive for that sort of process to play out that way. Uh, and so they, they used a different framework to try to prevent the FBI from getting access to things that would have helped the FBI, but maybe have harmed the CIA's collection process. Um, a final piece um, that, that sort of popped up here is that Hastert notes that policymakers were oftentimes seeking to get access to raw information. So as this, um, you know, collected information comes in, there's oftentimes a process of you know, translating it, providing source notes about whether or not this is credible, whether or not the person who's providing this information actually has this access. Do they have reason to you know, betray or mislead? Do we have doubts about their loyalty or their um, intentions? Um, that would be normally attached to a, a particular piece of information, or it would be put in a larger context around where it was gathered, or how it was gathered, um, that might make it, make something that, that initially seems provocative, um, much less so. Uh, yet policymakers were, were frequently seeking to get that raw intelligence um, that might be provocative, that, that would require a larger context to really fully understand, um, which limits the ability of the intelligence community to provide well-reasoned, well-informed, and comprehensive information to policymakers if they're going through and cherry-picking out pieces of information without context, which is problematic. When it came to the analysis piece, Hastert notes that in spite of everything, um, it seems as though things were coming together. And, and Thomas Finger talks about how the job of an intelligence analyst is to put together a puzzle when you have all these pieces and you're not even sure that they go together and you're not even sure they're from the same puzzle and you're not even sure what the puzzle is supposed to look like. 
and yet you're just kind of fitting these pieces together. And yet in spite of all of that, um, it did seem in sort of the summer of 2001 that the intelligence community was picking up that Al-Qaeda was onto something big, that they seemed to be preparing for something um, that the, the things that, that would normally signal an alarm <laughs> Um, were happening and the intelligence community was picking up on it and pushing that out to policymakers. Um, but just because something big is happening, we don't necessarily know what that big thing is. Um, it could be a sign of an impending terrorist attack. It could be a sign of an impending um, ad advance in the Afghan civil war. It could be, as Paul Wolfowitz suggested, Al-Qaeda trying to gauge U.S. reaction um, to its behavior, right? That one of the things that nefarious organizations like Al Qaeda will do is they'll try to figure out how they're being monitored, right? Do they have spies internally that are providing information on them? Are their communications secure? And so maybe, you know, these, this, the increased chatter or the decline in chatter was the was Al Qaeda trying to, to sort of suss out what the United States knew about what it was doing. That's plausible. Um, and not every realize in hindsight with the September 11th attacks killing thousands of people and doing massive damage, um, that assertion by Wolfowitz really looks um, damning, I guess would be the, the expression. Um, but it's not a, an unreasonable question to sort of wrestle with as we're looking at this puzzle with all these pieces and not even sure if they fit together, and not even sure if this puzzle piece is actually real information or somebody engaging in denial and deception uh, or counterintelligence. Uh, it's it's really hard to, to do this particular piece. Um, another problem, however, that has to flags is this idea of um, cases being owned by agents. Um, within the FBI in particular. And we kind of flagged this a little bit earlier with the collection piece, but it really comes up here with, with the analysis piece that an FBI agent isn't necessarily thinking about how to prevent Al-Qaeda from launching an attack on the United States or whether Al-Qaeda is intending to launch an attack in the United States. The FBI is organized around this idea of we need a court case against a particular person. And so the kind of information that we're putting together and the, is information that's relevant to that, to that very narrow kind of problem, um, which is important but didn't necessarily help in terms of resolving this this overall intelligence failure of not seeing, recognizing, or responding to um, a threat from Al-Qaeda that, that was incoming and um, potentially obvious in hindsight. Okay, so when it comes to dissemination, um, the analysts were sort of picking up something big is happening and they tried to push that out to the policy community. There were numerous reports, there were numerous briefings. Um, the National uh, Security Council advisor, uh, Condoleezza Rice, uh, ends up briefing uh, John Ashcroft, the Justice Attorney General, um, saying that an attack is imminent, that the United States will be attacked by Al Qaeda. Um, that that's what the intelligence is pointing to. Likewise, um, there were more than 40 articles in the President's Daily Brief that were highlighting bin Laden, highlighting Al Qaeda, including sort of the famous one, Al Qaeda determined, or bin Laden determined to strike America. Um, the Bush administration and President Bush in particular has argued that yes, there was all of that information. They were being told that, you know, there was a threat incoming and that it was imminent. Um, no, not imminent, that, that there was a threat incoming, but it was understood as a historical sort of uh, uh, background on the the topic rather than a uh, sign that something imminent was about to happen, um, which is problematic. When it comes to um, the dissemination, another part of the problem is that there just hadn't been a major overview of terrorism and the capabilities of terrorist organizations. Uh, that pulls together everything from the intelligence community. The last national intelligence estimate that had focused on terrorism was in 1995. In 1995, the United States really didn't even have the language of Al Qaeda as a, as a group. It had been in existence for maybe six years. Um, and even though the United States was picking up on um, individuals that were working on behalf of Al Qaeda, didn't really understand that this was part of a larger network uh, where it came from and, and certainly didn't have a sense of its capabilities. Uh, and so the, 
the understanding of this organization was very much dated uh, and there were multiple attacks preceding this that should have indicated that al-Qaeda was gaining capacity, that they were getting more aggressive and more ambitious, and it would have been potentially useful to pull all of that information together uh, in a more timely manner. Uh, and then finally, when we think about the evaluation piece or the feedback piece, there were a number of changes that were implemented to the intelligence community following the attacks of September 11th, following sort of this, this major intelligence and policy failure. Um, so one of those was the Bush administration rewriting executive orders governing intelligence collection and essentially taking the gloves off that had been put on um, during the Clinton administration and returning the intelligence community to a war footing um, in terms of their encouraging them to take risks, encouraging them to seek out information wherever it might be. There were reforms in the Patriot Act that would allow the intelligence community to get information more easily, um, potentially working outside of a warrant system. Uh, and then in 2004, there was an Intelligence Reform and Terrorism Prevention Act, which sort of helped overhaul the intelligence community. Um, I believe this is the one that establishes the Director of National Intelligence. Don't quote me 100% on that. Um, but there were these major reforms to try to get the intelligence community to work more effectively together and to share information more effectively. But as Hastit notes, um, they were sort of shuffling around of the chairs bureaucratically, but the feedback that was coming from policymakers after September 11th wasn't continue to, to dig into Al Qaeda and figure out what's going on. A lot of the focus shifted to weapons mass destruction in Iraq, and that really became the, the major question that was put to the intelligence community. A lot of energy and resources were put into that particular problem. And so we didn't necessarily see uh, a, a refinement that would have necessarily fixed some of the problems and, and, and limitations in this process that has to lays out. Okay, so what are some of the takeaways um, from thinking about the intelligence cycle, not just as sort of this abstract, here are the six steps and they go in a circle, but thinking about it in terms of this particular case. And I think for me, um, there's two important takeaways and two that I, I try to really impress upon my students in US foreign policy, one of which is that states are not sort of coherent, um, unified actors. That states are made up of lots of different organizations and those organizations may have different goals. They may have different priorities. And while they may all nominally be supporting, you know, the national security of the United States of America, they might understand that role and that responsibility in very different ways. And that might mean that they don't always work together, coordinate or cooperate in ways that would be efficient. And so when we're thinking about the intelligence community, it's worth recognizing that that is not a fully integrated um, kind of entity. There are deep divisions, um, different cultures across the intelligence community that can inhibit the, the process of, of intelligence gathering uh, analysis and dissemination in ways that, that can have real consequences. A second takeaway I would maybe offer to folks is that we oftentimes think about cycles like this that have sort of feedback as part of that cycle as focused on quality improvement, right? You don't get the results you want, you give the information that hopefully will improve the planning so that you get better results next time. But again, that's not always what happens and that's not necessarily even what the intelligence cycle is intended to do. It's not necessarily intended to fix the problems of the past. It's intended to provide to policymakers intelligence products that policymakers want and believe they will find useful. And to that end, the feedback and the, the um, planning that can come through this intelligence cycle may not really reflect the need to improve. It may reflect the need to move on. Um, which is something that I think also comes through in this case, uh, but is not something that would have been, I think, necessarily obvious just looking at the intelligence cycle as a cycle, assuming the idea is to get better with each iteration of that process. So I think there's a lot to be said for thinking about this in terms of uh, the case, and I hope that it helps to sort of reinforce this idea of the intelligence cycle and the various parts that go into it.